Well, thanks for the invitation today. Um, I'm a scientist at IDT. I work in the research and development group, specifically the cell biology uh, research and development group. So a lot of the work we do is involved with optimizing and finding the most functional nucleic acid, synthetic DNA, synthetic RNA in the form of an siRNA, microRNA, antisense oligo, and now more specifically um, working on optimizing the CRISPR system. So we do a lot of our work in tissue culture, developing the most functional siRNA or um, CRISPR system to provide to people like you for then now your delivery systems. So a lot of the work I'm doing today is working in um, tissue culture cells, delivering with a commercial lipid reagent or with uh, electroporation. So I've really enjoyed hearing all these um, more complex delivery systems today. <clears throat> so diving into CRISPR, I'm gonna give a little bit of background. I'm not sure what the um, level of background here is today, but um, CRISPR is quickly becoming the most popular and effective way for genome editing. And uh, CRISPR stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Palindromic Repeats, and it is a bacteria's defense mechanism that's been harnessed now to edit genomes in mammalian cells. <clears throat> And CRISPR requires two components in the cell to function. You need your guide RNA, which right here is composed of two uh, strands of RNA, the CRISPR RNA, <clears throat> which has the target-specific region here in yellow, and that associates with the trace RNA, which is a conserved strand that then associates with a Cas9 endonuclease. This then directs the Cas9, when associates with the CRISPR trace RNA, directs this to your genome, finds the area that is specific to the region of your CRISPR RNA that is preceding a PAM motif, which is a protospacer adjacent motif in the case of the most common form of Cas9, strut pyogenes, and NGG. <clears throat> After finding this region, the Cas9 endonuclease will, will create a double-stranded break in your genome and will undergo one of two uh, repair mechanisms. The most predominant method is non-homologous end joining, shown on the right, which is error prone, so insertions and deletions occur as the DNA is, is, comes back together, which often can result in a frame shift and a knockout of protein. Uh, the other pathway is homology-directed repair, which requires a third component, a, a donor template that would have a gene you're wanting to incorporate or a correction that you're trying to induce that would have homology-directed arms that you are then inserting into that double-stranded break. <clears throat> today, uh, sorry, this is not working the best. Um, today, I'm just gonna focus on the non-homologous end joining pathway, uh, but if you have any questions for me on specifically homology-directed repair, I'd be happy to discuss that later as well. Now, as I mentioned, you need to get two components in your cell for CRISPR editing to happen. You need your Cas9 protein and you need your CRISPR guide RNA. Now, there are many different ways you can introduce these two components. Uh, what a very common way that people introduce these is down at the bottom using an all-encompassing combined expression plasmid that has promoters that will express the protein and the RNA once in the cell. But this ends up being a very large plasmid that can be difficult to transfect at times and is not transient. So it can re, uh, lead to increased off-target effects if this is going down a therapeutic route. So people are now looking into splitting the components apart into, and delivering in their individual forms. So there are many options here on the right uh, for, deli for delivering guide RNA. You can um, separate the guide RNA into its own expression plasmid you can insert it as a linear DNA fragment. You can transcribe it into RNA in vitro, deliver that, or you can deliver synthetic RNA oligos to your cell. <clears throat> uh, for the Cas9 as well, there are many forms. You can use a Cas9 plasmid. You can deliver a Cas9 in mRNA form that's then translated in the cell. You can develop, for research purposes, a Cas9 stable cell line or you can directly deliver the Cas9 protein. And what has become our preferred method that I'll discuss today is delivering the RNA in a 
uh, chemically synthesized RNA form. This allows you to introduce chemical modifications that can do increase stability. And in introducing the Cas9 directly as protein. This has no uh, DNA expression cassettes that are ever in introduced into your cell. These complex really nicely and can be easily delivered into a lot of cell types. Um, our initial work, though, however, was optimizing the, the guide RNA portion, trying to find the most optimal links and modifications that will provide you with the highest level of editing. So to do that, we developed a Cas9 cell line. So we are taking out the bias of Cas9 getting into the cell that you often have when you're delivering Cas9 as a plasmid. So the first work I'll show you is development of the guide RNA. Now, an innovation that came out of the GENIC 2012 paper was the fusion of the CRISPR and tracer RNA into one complex, which is known as an sgRNA, single guide RNA. And this works nicely for expression systems where they're running off of one, uh, one promoter. And these are, as I previously discussed, you, would introduce, you could introduce this in a plasmid form as an in vitro transcribed RNA. But the path we've pretty much focused on is, is introducing these in their natural form, which is a two-part system where you have the CRISPR RNA and the tracer RNA. Now, the natural lengths of these two complexes are fairly long, especially the tracer RNA for chemical synthesis. The CRISPR RNA, <clears throat> come out here. Yeah, I'm okay. Uh, the CRISPR RNA here is 42 bases in length, and that contains the target-specific region. And the tracer RNA is 89 bases in length. This is in its natural form. So 89 bases is still quite long for, chemical, for robust chemical synthesis. So the first thing we looked at was if we could shorten these at all. These are the lengths that were optimized in a bacterial system, but are these necessarily the optimal lengths in a mammalian system? And what works nicely if you break these up into their two components is the tracer RNA is always the same. So we can make this in a highly purified, large-scale synthesis. You can order this as a stock product, and every time you want to study a new target, you just have to order your short, your short piece, the CRISPR RNA. So the first thing we looked at was shortening these strands, both the CRISPR RNA and tracer RNA. And actually what we found, we were hoping to find something that worked as well, but we actually found cases where they act, shortening them actually worked better. So here we're, we're looking at a T7 endonuclease cleavage assay. There's many different ways to assess your genome editing, whether it's deep sequencing, um, uh, heteroduplex assays. Here we're looking at a mismatch endonuclease assay. So here we're looking at percent cleavage according to this assay. And you can see here when we use a 67 nucleotide tracer RNA, compared to a 36 nucleotide tracer RNA, and you compare that to the natural length of a 42 nucleotide CRISPR RNA and an 89 nucleotide tracer RNA, we actually, actually saw about a threefold increase in editing. And now 67 nucleotides is of a length that is reliable for high throughput chemical synthesis. So now another advantage that you have with using chemi chemically synthesized RNAs is the option to modify the bases. And it is fairly well known, and we've heard um, some of this discussed today, that unmodified nucleic acids are rapidly degraded in serum um, and or by cellular nucle nucleases, and that chemical modifications can be used to stabilize the nucleic acid and help avoid triggering an innate immune response. There are many different types of modifications in the general toolbox. And with the CRISPR and tracer RNA, there poses a lot of places you can modify, a lot of different linkages. And so we spent a lot of time studying many, many modifications, placements of the modifications, and links to come up with a construct that is highly stable and functional in the cell. And kind of got an interesting story out of it as well when we were studying. We found areas that essentially were an on-off in each of the CRISPR and tracer RNA components that tolerated modification. So here we're just specifically looking at the tracer RNA, and if and this is now with our, our length op optimization we did of the shortened tracer RNA of 67 bases. So if we use a fully unmodified, here in black, tracer RNA, we're looking at about 60% editing. Now in this case, if we fully modify every single base, we completely abolish activity. 
And then here in this slide, we show where we are walking in on different sides of the, the different ends of the tracer RNA, and we get to regions where we completely lose activity. Again, walking in from this end, we go from having full activity and we completely lose activity. And this was also uh, seen when we studied the CRISPR RNA. Here, so the CRISPR RNA, again, contains the target-specific region, which is known as the protospacer. And here is the tracer binding component. And here we see the full activity when we're working with an unmodified CRISPR RNA. And when we fully modify the CRISPR RNA, we completely abolish activity. These are different types of modifications and areas that didn't toler tolerate modification. But again, we found these areas that where we maintain full activity and we completely lose activity. So essentially, the, what we've learned and what we've developed is this kind of roadmap of where you can modify the tracer RNA <clears throat> or the CRISPR RNA and maintain your activity. Now, the protospacer area of the CRISPR RNA is, is a lot more sequence-specific biases because that is where you have your target-specific region. But these are areas that are well-tolerated, and we now have uh, different patterns depending on the system you're in. If you need to be in a, if you're in a high nuclease environment, if, you're, if your um, oligos are protected by a liposome, or what level of modification you need that can actually improve activity as well as make them more stable. Here's just a nice comparison showing now we're looking at four different sites. So four, we would have ordered four different CRISPR RNAs and paired that to the tracer RNA. And we're looking at the editing here. In green is using the optimized uh, CRISPR RNAs, the 3667 nucleotide Alt-R system is what we can now call the modification and length improvements we've developed compared to the natural system breaking that up into two components still. The increase in editing you see at four different sites. If you deliver this as an in vitro transcribed sgRNA, as a plasmid, or as a G-block, where you can see here, the, we've looked at many, many sites, but this is kind of a nice snapshot just to show the level of editing we, we've seen now that we've length and um, modified, op, modification optimized this system. So most of the work I've discussed so far was where we were focusing on developing that guide RNA portion, optimizing that. So we were working, a lot of that work was done in cells that already express Cas9 to take out the bias of Cas9 not being transfected at a high efficiency. There have been several publications now that have come out about directly delivering Cas9 proteins. So the guide RNA can actually bind to the, the the Cas9 protein and form what's called a ribonuclear protein complex, an RNP, and this can be delivered into cells. It's in vitro, combine the two in equal molar amounts, your guide RNA and protein, for five minutes, and this can be delivered at a very high efficiency with lipofection or with electroporation. Electroporation requires you to obviously use a lot more material and a lot more cells, but this works very well, and now that you're directly delivering the protein, you are reducing your risks of mosaicism. Uh, your protein is rapidly degraded, so your off-target effects are reduced, and you have a much higher transfection efficiency. Here's a nice publication that kind of shows this, where here we are showing if you deliver Cas9 in a plasmid DNA form, that via a Western blot, showing that the protein is made overexpressed over time, where the delivering this in the direct protein form, it's a rapid on-off. It's degraded quickly, and because of that, you have a reduction in off-target effects, and this has been shown in several publications now as well. So here's kind of a snapshot of how this delivery system works. It's a simple three-step system where you order your two components, your CRISPR RNA, which again has your, in yellow, your target specific area that you're studying. And there is uh, many tools out there for, if, if you have a target you wanna, I don't have time to go into this today, but for the target that you're interested in, there's many design tools and algorithms out there for designing the best CRISPR RNA. But actually, these are very effective. They're much more effective than sRNAs where algorithms are more important. If you order a couple guide RNAs, the hit rate of these is very high. We're seeing a good 75 to 80% of just random 
ordering a random design without putting a lot of bioinformatic algorithm for on target. Those uh, algorithms are very helpful when you're looking into off target effects, but the, it's, the take home is that this just works really, really well. As unlike antisense and RNAi, where the development of the actual sequence is much more difficult. So you have your CRISPR RNA that you combine in equal molar amounts with the tracer RNA. Again, this is a highly purified HPLC purified uh, bulk. You can order this in up to 100 nanomol scale if you'd like. You then uh, and you anneal these at a one to one ratio, molar ratio and then combine that complex at a one-to-one one -to -one ratio with your Cas9 protein, and that is then your RNP complex that can be delivered into cells via lipofection or electroporation. Or the methods we're using, these can also be microinjected. <clears throat> I thought this would be a nice slide specifically for this group. Um, so uh, we have tried several commercial lipids for delivering the RNP complex, and and our hands have only really seen high efficiency when we're using uh, lipofectamine RNAi max or CRISPR max. Some other commercially available lipids um, hasn't given us the high level of editing or robust editing that we've seen. So I'm interested to find other lipids or uh, other methods of delivering the RNP complex without having to use electroporation where you use a lot of material <clears throat> and just a lot of toxicity and other lipids we've studied. But are, t are typical for easy to transect cell lines that will tolerate this getting in with a lipid. We typically use RNAi max delivering a 10 nanomolar of the RNP complex. Uh, this is delivered very efficiently with electroporation. Uh, we can get this into GERCAT cells with a 90% editing efficiency. Here is a dose response curve that just kind of nicely shows how you have to use a lot more material. In green is a modified complex, where now we're using two to four micromolar of the complex as opposed to 10 nanomolar. And if you're, if you're down at the 100 nanomolar range here, you're not really seeing any editing, so you really have to get up. And this also shows that in green is a modified version of the guide RNA compared to an unmodified. So now that you're in a less protected environment, the benefit you do see of using a modified complex, a chemically modified complex. So we, um, at IDT, we, our research group focuses in tissue culture lines. We have a lot of collaborators that work in more complex systems that have been great to provide us with some nice uh, feedback, uh, great beta test sites to provide you some uh, more interesting organism systems. Um, in this case, this is an IDT pharma customer who is working in primary T cells, looking at loss of CD3 expression via FACS. And their primary source of introducing Cas9 was with mRNA. So this was pretty well optimized, the amounts that they were using. We also asked them to introduce this with protein. Um, they introduced this with uh, electroporation. The optimal amounts of protein is two to four micromolar. They were a little under, so that's worth noting for showing the data, but the data is still really interesting. And here they were comparing using our synthetic to oligo system for the guide RNA as an unmodified or as a modified complex in these primary T cells. Again, uh, electroporating in. And this is interesting and shows the benefits of the modified RNA oligos. So the first panel up top is introducing the Cas9 as an mRNA, and then using the CRISPR and tracer RNA in different forms of either completely unmodified or with our um, optimized modification pattern. So they see absolutely uh, no effect when the uh, tracer RNA is unmodified or when the CRISPR RNA is modified, but once they modify both, the, once they use our, our modified CRISPR and tracer RNA, they see really great activity and have now actually gotten this up to 80%. Uh, but when using the protein, now they do see some effect. And again, this is a little suboptimal for the amount of protein, protein they delivered. But the effect of modification isn't as predominant. And we believe this is because with the Cas9 mRNA, the RNAs are having to wait around for the protein to be made. So they're going to be a little more susceptible to degradation. But still, overall, the modification patterns are really helping improve. And they were able to see really high efficiency. And now they're not introducing a DNA construct or having to remake a new DNA construct every time they want to 
to test a new system. So they're able to scale this up to a really high throughput method and we're really happy with this. <clears throat> Here is just another slide in C. elegans showing a benefit of this is studying our two-part system where using the modified constructs, they see much higher gene conversion. So to kind of uh, just wrap up some of the advantages I've said of this system now that uses two synthetic RNA oligos for the CRISPR and tracer RNA and a protein over the other commonly used systems um, compared to DNA expression cassettes, these are extremely easy to complex and have very high ed uh, editing efficiency and transfection efficiency and have a reduced off-target effect, and there's no risk of DNA integration. We often see when you introduce the, either the guide RNA or the protein in a DNA form after you make that double-stranded break, part of the DNA from the the promoter gets in, inserted back into that double-stranded break, so you don't have that risk now. <clears throat> Compared to a way to get around that is to just to make your RNA in vitro before delivered. But with this, there, there's really a, no great QC method for that, and th ordering the chemically synthesized version is going to be a lot more high throughput amenable and have a mass spec, spec guaranteed QC and allow for chemical modifications. And some other uh, companies now are chemically synthesizing the full sgRNA, so the full 100 mer, and that also works well, but those are very expensive. They're about $2,000 a piece, and then you're going to have to resynthesize the full 100 mer every time you want to study a new target as opposed to just the shorter version. So kind of going back to this, um, what can be an overwhelming slide at the beginning of all the different ways that you can CRISPR, these are what we've settled on um, as our favorite, the two-part oligo system for the guide RNA and Cas9 directly as a protein, but we do also offer a plasmid and a DNA form for both the guide RNA and the Cas9 protein. And I also threw this up here quick for uh, this audience in particular. We are soon going to be having a dye-labeled tracer that has a Psi-3 or Psi-5 sortable ver um, uh, fluorophore on it. Here we're showing that we've labeled the tracer RNA and electroporated this into GERCAT cells. And again, like I mentioned, we're seeing about 90% uh, uptake, and then this would allow you to um, sort out cells that had not necessarily been edited, but had taken up the appropriate cargo. And I didn't get into all the background, if any of you are somewhat new to CRISPR, but we do have a lot of nice webinars and supporting information on our website if you want to learn a little bit more about this or some uh, more background into the system. And with that, I'll take any questions. Great, that was fantastic. Um, question with the single oligo system versus the two oligo mm -hmm. systems. Is there any differences in off-targeting or other toxicology issues between the two? Um, we have not seen any difference in off-target effects, no. Oh. Okay, cool. Uh, thanks, Ashley. Question on the, the, the molar ratio between the, you know, the guide strand and the the, the protein is the one to one optimal? Um, we've found with lipofection, the one to one is optimal. With electroporating, we do put in a little bit more guide RNA. We're at about a 1.2 to 1 ratio. But if we get, we can increase the amount of guide RNA, but we don't really get to a point that it's getting any better. 